This is the last sermon in the series on mentoring. So, let's go. I've called it Shake It. Uh, they refer back to Shake It. And what I found is an image of uh, a, a tree, a fruit tree, that's obviously been shaken and the fruit is falling. Um, it's really annoying when, like, if you've ever had a fruit tree, uh, when the, before the, even, the fruit's even ripe, it's all like got worms in it. It's like, ah, oh, how annoying. We have to come up with clever ways of going and mix brilliant out of it, putting nets and all sorts of things over just so you can benefit from the fruit. And I think in our lives, in Christ, with the Spirit of God in us, there is fruit designed to come out of our life. And sometimes, before we're even ready to drop it, <laughs> it's ruined. Something gets on the inside and just, you know, just poisons it or something. But I believe that's not what we're supposed to be as Christians. We're designed to be people who bear fruit. And that people around us can, are, are supposed to eat the fruit that comes off our life. As Christians, we're a blessing to the whole world. Whether people respond to Christ or not, just you and I being in it is an absolute blessing. You know, God is life. And with his words, he spoke and life came into being. God is alive and well today. And as we live, as we speak, as we do, life is flowing from us and blessing the world around us, I believe. And so, in it, what I'm trying to get out of this morning is that we would be confident and aware that in our lives in Christ are bearing fruit and the fruit that's coming from our life is here to bless the world around you. I'm going to refer back to our conversation again, Brad. It was really good. But uh, about being a missionary, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard. Like when you come to Christ, and, and you know, we've talked about this too, Matt, and I, I think a lot of people do. When you get excited about God and you come into a whole new world, it's really hard to um, consolidate your mundane life. Great. So do I still have to get up in the morning and brush my teeth and go to work and be tired at times? And it's like, there's so much more inside of me that wants to burst out. Has anyone ever experienced that before? Yeah. yeah. There's so much more. It's like, ah! So we think, how do I express this? I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll be a missionary. I'll plot myself in another country or I'll do something dramatic. And sometimes God will lead you to do that. Right? Sometimes God will. But you know, once you've plucked your life up and planted it somewhere else or you've started a whole new exciting journey, ex started the exciting journey, every journey often starts with excitement, but then you've got to get on with the work. And then you find yourself, oh, now I'm in another country. Now I'm starting this new project. How can I still get tired? How can I still need to brush my teeth in the morning? How can I still need to find work to get income? How can I need to still... But guess what? That's what we're doing right here. And so our mental shift, and this series will hopefully help us, and for anyone that goes along with the Connect Group series, they can. Oh, by the way, if you're really keen on doing it, and you're not available on Tuesday night, let me know. Who knows? Maybe another group will fall in. It'll be really exciting. You know, we have two groups. Wow, that'd be amazing. Uh, more connection points for people to build a relationship and learn and love each other and grow in God together. But you can let me know about that later. Uh, but, you know, the past tells me that I'll need to press people, press people to, and talk to people individually. We can't do that. But just ignore the laws of life and just approach me. Okay? Uh, and then I'll see if there's enough people. But anyway, we are missionaries on this earth right now. Wherever we are. And yes, you're going to have to do the things that you have to do anywhere in the world. The thing is, this thing of the kingdom of God that's in our heart, that's the yearning and desire to be at home. And where is home as Christians? Can I, can I offer you this thought? You don't have a home on planet Earth anymore if you've found Christ and got turned in your heart. Ultimately, you know your only home is to be with God in eternity. And the only sense of home that you'll get on Earth is being with God's people and being in His presence. Anything else, you can buy the, you can build the nicest home. Sorry, no, I, I don't know if anyone in this bed, probably not. But, uh, 
You can build a nice assumption because he's starting at Cartesians of the thing and he's working for Ventura now. So, Ventura, if you need to build a home, you can go that way. Um, just mention my name, I don't want to get a cut. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but we, can, we, we try really hard in life, all our life, if we don't have Christ, to build up something to make us feel at home. But there is no place that's called home on this earth. Because our original designer and creator was God. And our only home is Him. I've often heard people say there's a God-shaped hole in your heart, and the only thing that can fill it is God. Well, it might sound a bit corny, you've heard that a few times, but I think it's true. <laughs> the only thing that makes us feel at home is with Him. And even as Christians, we get frustrated at times, because we feel like, is this it? No, it's not. Our home is with Him forever and ever and ever. So don't worry about trying to make home and life just right now. It's never any journey. And then, just before you die, when you've just got enough money for retirement and things like that, I mean, it's all too late, isn't it? I mean, we get in a cycle of like, oh, I've got to make it until I get here, or until I get there, until I pay off my home, until I do this, until I do that. And then, next thing you know, we're dead! <laughs> <laughs> it's encouraging word. <laughs> You're all going to die. <laughs> But not really. And that's why Jesus says, invest in the things that are eternal. You know? I was joking with Brooke that she asked me to do something very small. And, um, and, and then she made a joke, oh, don't worry, your reward will be in heaven. And I go, I'm ready to cash in now. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, I just lost a few. And I said, oh, yeah, I've got enough. Anyway, I've been mean, arrogant and horrible. But in a sense, our mentality is, yeah, we know where our home is. And the things that we do now, is going towards hopefully something of an eternal nature. But uh, what, what do we do now? I'm going to look at the, the key verse of this uh, series, and it was this, Mark 3, 13 to 15. It says, Jesus went up on a mountainside, and he called to them those he wanted, and they came to him. And we've done some, uh, looked at who he wanted, and those he wanted were those that were willing to drop everything, those that were just honest of their heart, those that weren't overly into the world of being religious, but you know, lived authentically and were raw and real people. And he called to them and they came to him. Um, and he appointed the twelve that they might be with him. That's what we're called to be. It's pretty dramatic. We're called to be with Jesus, you know? Um, and that he might send them out to preach. What does that mean to preach? It's not just what I'm doing now. If that was the case, then a lot of us will feel like, oh, when's my turn? I've got to fulfill what God wants for my life. No, to preach is to have a proclamation of something that's going on in your life that's coming out. You know? It's in you. It's through you. Your preaching is sometimes used, you need words to preach, but so much more, it requires your lifestyle and actions. Actually, people will not want to hear what you want to say if your lifestyle doesn't match up. We're preaching all the time. We're witnesses of Jesus Christ and His Word been done in my life. And you know, this week, you know, let me put a little disclaimer because some of you are already thinking, oh, I'm not like that, or I'm not that spiritual. Neither am I. <laughs> this week I've been thinking, regularly, this little battle, let me just expose the enemy in front of you all in my own life. This week I've been grappling in and out of not being good enough, not being Christian enough, being a fake. You know? Oh, and, and, I, and I struggle with that. Because sometimes I know I'm worshipping and I'm preaching and God moves through my life and I think people are seeing God and they're not seeing the real me. And the enemy will be like, that's not even you. Everyone else is actually a better Christian than you, even like those in church and things like that, and you're a fake. And it's like, they're all lies. Because everything I am in Christ is total, 100% grace. So when I say, it even comes from my head as I speak, and it probably goes in your head, that's probably why I need to say, oh yeah, we go out and we're witnesses of Jesus and fruit. What do you do when you just yell at your kids in public? Accidentally, like, so just, then it's like, yeah, see? You know, I could. It's like, no. I love what Greg uh, prayed about this morning. We're authentic. It's real. You know, people aren't interested in people that are faking it. Not that we all purposely act as badly as we can just to keep it real. <laughs> but we, we're honest on that with our heart. We're not trying to build up a reputation of ourselves. We're just being ourselves. 
We're our weak selves with an extraordinary saviour. So I need to train myself and hopefully tell you in the process that when you go out this afternoon, yeah, it's not all about you. It's about Christ in you. And he's able to show off through your life in spite of your bad behaviour and your bad attitude. His grace is sufficient for you. You know, Paul had a weakness. He was so frustrated with his weakness. I don't exactly know what it is. Some theologians go, it's this and it's that. And you might be one of those who go, I know exactly what it was. But, you know, generally most people don't know what the weakness was. He goes, ah, take this weakness away from me. God said, my, my power is made perfect in weakness. It's really cool. As I said like, the other week, when Peter came to Jesus, Jesus said, come on, Peter, follow me. He goes, no way. He rejected Jesus. He goes, no, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Peter had no idea that's exactly what Jesus wanted to hear, a heart of repentance, knowing exactly where his heart was, because, because he knew where he was at, Jesus could take him somewhere. It's amazing to work with humble people, because you can actually learn and grow together. Once we get a little bit of arrogance, we think we know who we are, you can't grow. That's it. It's over. But if we are humble, as Christ wants us to be humble, and we're a bit like Peter, like, ah, oh, no, I'm not there. If you're honest about it, you can grow so much just by being real. And the cool thing is you don't have to live up to the facade you're trying to create all the time. You can just be real. And so these are the type of people he called to himself that they might go out and preach, be his witnesses. This riffraff bunch of whatever, it's fishermen, people who used to work for the enemy, the Roman government, all these different types of people came together and they were the ones to show off how cool God was. What a nice selection. I reckon we could fit that category. I don't know if you've been working for the enemy government or whatever, if you're a <laughs> Russian spy, you know, even if you're not, you're probably accused of it. But anyway, um, so you don't know what your background is. You're the one that gets chosen. And the world and the enemy want, would want to tell you, no, not you. Everyone else is just a bit of cut above you, and you know, because I know. And that condemnation comes and robs us from being free and being uh, able to grow. And it's really cool. The most exciting thing I hear about is when people get confidence in themselves in Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so cool. You know, I just love, um, you know, put, it, put you on the spot list. I love hearing about you using your prophetic gift more. It's like, yes! More, because I know it's a confidence thing. It's a growing thing. It's like, that's an example of all of us. So we all need growing. The gifts, and you know, we, we sometimes come tentatively, like the little boy, oh, I've got fish and loaves. Great. Boom. Let's see what God can do with that. You know, just that simple part of that boy just going, oh, I know it's not enough, but I'll give you what I've got. And it's like, yes. Boom. God blesses the world through that. Through that simple offering of the gift that you have. Anyway, I'm going on. I've got so much here. Anyway. So you're going out to preach, that's your life, through your work, through your leisure, through going to the shops, you know, sometimes you feel like you're not a great weakness, but God wants to show off through you anyway. <laughs> to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. You know, the thing that Jesus was most, that people were most amazed about Jesus, is that he was one who taught with authority. And the atmosphere kept responding to it. See, when he was talking in the synagogue, demons started shouting when they never used to shout before. And he always used to shut them up and get rid of them. He saw there was issues of getting rid of demons here and everywhere. I believe <laughs> that as we go out to be his witnesses in his atmospheres, and, 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 and sorry, as we go out to be his witnesses, something of the presence of God is emitted from our life, and that the powers of darkness can't exist in the presence. Of his spirit. They couldn't exist when Jesus taught in the synagogue. They started yelling and screaming. Right? When we go out and about, I believe something is agitated in the spiritual realm. And we don't talk about that heaps because we don't see it very clearly. But I'm sure most of us here have a story about a spiritual experience they've had. I used to teach scripture in a really rough public high school. Uh, you said um, it was really cool because you can do that in these type of class. The door's open. You can provide someone that. Let it happen, not, certainly not here. Um, I'm trying to think of why, why I said that. The spiritual experience. The spiritual. 
Oh yeah, that's right. And sometimes you, you go into your scriptures and talk about God, and just you, know, you can see they're switched off because they don't believe in anything. Until you go, oh, okay, what about anyone having spiritual experiences? And you trick them into proclaiming what they've experienced spiritually, and then you go, you believe in something spiritual then. Now let me tell you about God. <laughs> and it suddenly becomes real, because in our heart we know, but, we, but the world, wants, we want to harden our hearts for the accountability of a presence of God. We kind of instinctively try and remove God at a distance, but actually we are standing, or you're sitting, in the presence of Almighty God. We are in a spiritual atmosphere. And the spiritual atmosphere of darkness hates it. We are the hope of the world, we're the light of the world, and that's where I believe we have authority to drive out demons, not going up to people and going, I think you have a demon. Come out! I mean, that would be a bit odd. You know, a bit of a hit and miss. You might get one every day. I don't know. But, uh, but just being in this world, being his witnesses, agitates the spiritual environment around us. I know it happens. <laughs> when people don't like you irrationally, or all you've done is nice things and said nice things and they just feel uncomfortable around you, it's an agitation. It's not you. It's God in you. And greater is he that's in you than he's a, he that is in the world. Amen? Amen. In Mark chapter 4, verse 14, 20, it says this. The Father sows the word. Some people like seed among the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in. Others like the seed sown in rocky places hear the word and they once and at once they receive it with joy since they have no root. They only last a short time and when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others are seed that are sown among the thorns. They hear the word, the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. And the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. That can go with my little rant at the start about how we put our hope in all these other things, and it actually ends up choking our life, and then we end up dying. We might have this faith, but we're not fruitful. Let's not be like that. And don't say, if you're living like that, change now. <laughs> Done. Okay, <laughs> good. I hope you've made that decision in your heart. You've repented and totally turned turn the direction of your life. Don't live for those things. Others, others like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what is sown. That's you and I, I believe, in Jesus' name. That's what we're designed to be. And, and when you grow up, when you grow like a plant, let's say like a fruit tree, like the analogy I've put there, where does the fruit land? Predominantly, the fruit lands around where we are. Wherever you are, that's where the fruit lands. Sometimes a bird might eat the fruit and put it somewhere in the air and then somewhere else. And I believe that could happen too. We, we're here where we land and it can spread all around, but predominantly it's landing where we are. So where are you? <laughs> where are you working? Where's your family? You know? Where do you go shopping? Do you play sports or have a leisure group you go? Wherever you are, that's where it's landing. Um, and that's your realm of influence. Um, Paul um, was a missionary, in case you didn't know, and he just had this sense of just going out and preach the gospel anyway. Um, and I just want to follow this story a little bit. I hopefully won't take too long. Um, in Acts chapter 16, you can go there if you want. It's going to be on the screen too. This might go for a little while. But I thought it was a really good way of understanding about how we go about what we do and how we work out, you know, uh, the most common question that comes up often when if people could ask God a question is, oh, what am I supposed to do? You know? Do you ever get that question? What do you want me to do, Lord? What do you want me to do? And often what God wants us to do is already what we're doing. It's just shifting a little bit of the mentality towards what we're doing. And, and not being so result driven. It's like, okay, what do you want me to do? And if he says, just do what you're doing, you're like, but there's not enough results for that. Is there something better I can invest my life into? Sometimes I go, Lord, I think I was born in the wrong country. I'm hearing stories of amazing things happening in other places. Maybe I'd be better suited there uh, to get more return on my investment of my life. And God doesn't look at things so practically like us. He just goes, no, I just want you to exist where you are in shine for me. Don't worry. A couple of years, a few years ago, God said, would you do this church thing? I've said this story a lot of times. Bear with me if you heard it. Just after the first year of planning a church, 
Because it's so driven for godly success. People say and stuff. And he said to me, I feel in my heart, that's how God speaks to me, this is a strong impression. He said, this church, would you keep doing this if no one got saved? If I didn't move like you imagined me to? Would you do this if you were to do it just because I wanted you to? And in the honesty of my heart, I told him, no, I wouldn't. Because I was, I, and then I saw what was in my heart. I was driven towards success, albeit godly success, albeit for good things. Ultimately, at the heart of it, I was doing it for a return. I think it's a success part, even though I was in good things. And that little shift over time, as I learned to grow, that I would try to do things for God, no matter what was the return. Uh, is something that has shifted in my heart that I would hopefully, and I'm growing this all the time, just do things because God wanted me to. And you know what? If heaps of people did come to Christ, and I can't believe they will, and if God did move in, with wonders and, and cool things in our community, which I think He probably will, <laughs> I won't go on a high and a tangent either because I won't be doing it for that. I won't get my confidence from success. I'll get my confidence from today, when I might not see so much success. But I look at all this, this is pretty exciting, all the visitors and things like that, really cool people, worshipping loving God, that's pretty exciting. But I'm not going to let that be a little high today for my own confidence, because my confidence needs to be in the Lord. Do you know what I mean? It's a subtle shift. It's a subtle shift. And I think more fruit actually can come out of a shift in thinking toward the Lord and a heart full of like that. Where it doesn't matter, come what may, come with great success or not, it's all for Him and His glory. And so I won't go around looking at people that maybe they will give their heart to Christ, please. I'll just be living as a witness for Him, enjoying Him. And people might look at me and go, He doesn't seem as stressed out as other people, or like those other Christians who are straining and striving. But there's something different about Him. And that's the witness, that's the preach. That's coming out of our life. Anyway, I'll read the scripture. Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. And when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, something like that, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by. I'm going to keep changing the pronunciation of his name, Mysia, and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision. Okay, so he tried to go to two different places and God stopped him. Well, that's pretty cool. Just try and do things in life. If, you know, sometimes, if you're not sure what to do, give life a go. I've often said, hey, God, how about this? No! I'm like, okay, go. Go. How about this guy? I don't know. I feel all right about it. I'll do it. And if God wants to say no along the way, I know he said no before. You know, I remember as a teenager, I was, you know, thinking about this girl, and I thought, oh, what do you think? No! I'm like, okay! <laughs> <laughs> no more details required! <laughs> um, uh, I didn't give enough God, that time for God to say anything with Brooke. I was married to her and she was pregnant before I even had a chance to do anything. <laughs> uh, married first, then pregnant, yes, okay? <laughs> But, um, but that was a cool God thing too. It was like, yes! I was saying it anyway. Um, and just went with it. Uh, anyway, so he's got two no's. Don't go there, don't go there. Okay, cool. That's simple. And during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So it's like, I think that's God. You think? Yeah, I think we can conclude that's God. It wasn't even like, that was God. And then it just went with it. And this is what happened. You right? I'm sure they had a plan and everything like that. I promise they're in here. I'll just print it off. Um, so this is what happened. Okay? From Troas, we went out to sea and sailed for summer thrace. And the next day we went on to Neapolis. And then we travelled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. Here we go. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate 
to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. So now I'm looking for a place of prayer. Okay, that's where we're going. We sat down and began to speak, just randomly, to the women who had been gathered there. Another person did that. His name was Jesus, with a woman at the well, an old town, and was very responsive to the gospel. Uh, that wasn't part of the disciples' plan, and the disciples were really confused about why Jesus was talking to them, because that's not what they were doing. Certainly not for them. But anyway, Paul found him in the same situation. He's trying to go somewhere, and then, you know, chatting to some ladies there who had gathered there. And one of those who sitting there was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. And the Lord, the Lord, opened her heart. <laughs> no shock therapy uh, in the Word of God, unfortunately, man. Sometimes it's frustrating. You know, Come on, just believe. But uh, no, the Lord opened her heart and responded to Paul's message. And she and the members of her household were baptised and she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Well, that's a pretty cool brand event. I'm trying to go to the place of prayer. There's a bunch of ladies. Let's talk to them. Oh, whole family gets saved. Cool. God knew what was going on in that area. Right? He, he, he was reading the manual of church planting and where to plant churches and he was trying to go to those places and God said, no, go there. It's like, why go there? I don't know. God said, so I just do it. You know, I'm going to go there. Oh, this is a random thing. And once, when that we, once, when, again, when we were going to the place of prayer, by the way, that is a good direction to go in, to the place of prayer. To be with him. He called them to be with him. Mark that original scripture. And then he sent them out. In the intention of our heart, that's where we should be heading, to, the, to where God is, the place of prayer, right? There's great things that can happen on that journey of life. It's like, why are you going to the place of prayer, Paul? Aren't you supposed to be a missionary? Isn't there better things you can do with your time than just pray? No, that was his intention, and good things happen. Anyway, once when they were going to the place of prayer, they were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Oh, it's such a good opportunity to share my story now. Fortune telling. Can I say it? Really quick. What's the plan for my life, right? I'm sorry, every year I say it. And I just want to take some of the, the, the glory out of Halloween, right? My, my mum saw a fortune teller before she was, a, she was saved. Fortune teller told her she would have three kids. She had a miscarriage between the first and second. She got, she got saved whilst, whilst trying to christen my oldest sister, right? And the, the priest said, oh no, unless you're following Jesus, there's no point. So they got home and talked to each other, decided they would follow Jesus, and went back to the priest the next day. Anyway, could have got the christening thing done and all that type of thing. The priest actually said, oh, I don't really agree with the christening, but anyway, that was the solid point. They wanted to do it for the family thing. And, got, and then that's when they started. They moved to Australia and they had three kids. In between the first and second, she had, my mum had a miscarriage. So she knew what that felt like. She was pregnant with a fourth kid, right? That was me. And she started to miscarry me. And then she remembered the fortune teller had a story for her life, and that was three kids. But they were in Christ. So they rebuked that curse in Jesus' name, and miscarried feelings went away. And out came me on the 31st of October. Why? Why was I born that day, I believe? It might be just me. But I'm here to combat the powers of darkness. I'm here to be a witness of Christ. The enemy didn't want me to be here, but I'm here. That's, it's, it's amazing, it's pretty cool that it was born on that day, but that's our story. So while everyone's trying to look as disgusting and demonic as they can, I was born that day. Thank you very much. <laughs> to combat the powers of darkness in your face. Anyway, but this girl earned a lot of money by fortune telling, and she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Right? She's saying the correct thing. I've said this before. Demons often said the right thing, but with the wrong spirit. Sometimes you can't put a finger on why it's wrong, but you know something is wrong in the spirit. Right words, truth, wrong spirit. <laughs> she kept this up for many days, and finally Paul became so annoyed then he turned to her and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. And when her owners realised that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face authorities. So I'm going to skip over a bit here, just for the sake of time. They ended up going to prison. That was not the... And Paul and Silas were there. 
Alright? So they're in Macedonia now. It was a really cool start. I think, man, this trip must be amazing. Lydia and her family were already baptized. I say, what else is going to happen? Cast out a demon and then they end up in jail. <laughs> I'm going to go to verse 25. This is what they did. I probably could have kept reading because I just talked as long as it would have taken to read. But anyway, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. Oh, that's a good thing to do. And singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Oh, they're still bearing fruit. They're shaking it up in there. Shake it off from fruit there. Shake it off here. Shake it off there. Shake it all over everywhere. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> and the prisoners were listening to them. Can you imagine that? That would have been an unusual day to be in prison. Anyway, suddenly there was a violent earthquake and the foundations were shaken. And at once the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. And that's what Christ does, isn't it? There were four... Look, the other prisoners weren't singing hymns and praying and praising God. But they were around someone that was and they were blessed. See, we're witnesses. You know, it's not just about our own chains. We go about and sing in. They're listening. They're just bystanders. Their chains come loose too. And our role in this world is to be a witness around bearing fruit, seeing people's lives become more and more free because of what Christ has done in us. It's a power that can't be contained in a prison cell. Can't be contained in your mundane, boring life where there's so much things that it can't be contained. All right? <laughs> Everyone's chains came loose, and the jailer woke up. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. Wouldn't it be instinctive for all the other prisoners to run away? They were so moved by what had happened. They just wanted to be in prison. It's where the Spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom. And if there is the Spirit of God in the prison, the prison is where I want to be. Because that's where I <laughs> We're all here. <laughs> the jailer called the lights rushing in and trembling before Paul and Silas. He pulled them out and said, So what must I do to be saved? <laughs> Sometimes we're yelling at people, This is what you must do to be saved. Wouldn't it be great to have someone run up to us and say, What can I do to be saved? Oh, oh. <laughs> well, people might have those stories, but they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds and immediately he and all his household were baptised. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because, I mean, he was about to kill himself and now he's full of joy. Not long after, because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. And when it was daylight, the magistrate sent the officers to the jailer with the order to release them goes on. And, the, and, and then Acts continues. We're hearing these amazing stories about why Paul had to come to Macedonia. None of it was his plan for things that happened. He was on a path, he was on a journey, but God intervened. And so we don't have to be so stressed out about, whoa, what am I doing in life? Because God has your day sorted out for you. Just be aware, it's a good, good thing to do. Wake up and go, God, this is my day, it's yours. You don't need to know exactly what's going to happen. But we know that in Christ, every day is worthwhile. And some days might seem completely insignificant, but not in God's eyes. So where am I to preach the gospel? Where am I to be his witness? Witness. Where am I supposed to be available to share the good news? Anywhere that you are. This is not, I'm not trying to get a yoke, a burdensome thing, and put it over your shoulders and make it really hard. Living a life in Christ is full of joy and peace. And sometimes I know the reaction. I can feel it myself. I'm like, oh, I should be doing more. I should be doing more. I should be doing more. I should be a better Christian. I should pray more. I should read the Bible more. I should share about Jesus more. And this drive, this motor that keeps bashing us over the head saying, more, 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 more. No, that's not a drive. It's an overflow of what God's doing us. And it says he can do abundantly more 
than whatever we could ask or imagine. So when we're driving our own motor, we might get some stuff done and it can be really hard. But when we live a life in the Spirit, He does abundantly more than we could ask or imagine. It's the overflow. And it's His work. So can I encourage you? In your life, trust that God is producing fruit in your life and shake it. Fruit will come. Shake it. Wherever you are. I was so blessed this week, you know, I won't say the specifics because I believe people might start tapping in and listening and wanting to hear about God. But someone reached out in kindness. A Christian reached out in kindness and invited someone back to their place. And I haven't stopped thinking about it. Because it was like someone reached out in a, in a situation, I mean, they're dealing with a lot of stuff at the moment, right? They reached out and they just blessed someone. They reached out and they showed the fruit of the Spirit of kindness. And I was like, wow. We can get so, there's heaps for us all to get so stressed out about in life. Just running life, paying bills, rates, you know, getting work done. And then you finally get a day off and then you've got all this housework that's accumulated. Life's stressful. You've got all the excuse in the world not to think or care about anyone else because you've got enough problems all on your own. But it's a beautiful thing when someone reaches out and drops some fruit into someone else's heart. And they might not receive it, but something happens. And that's our life. We've got something to give, and it's very simple. Just loving the world around us, being of a different spirit, it's amazing. You can be that person in this world. Because we're spread out thin throughout this place, and we've got a far, a far reach. I believe we, if we can get this, our life will be more fun. We'll be free. Life in the spirit. And people will respond to the love and the, the love of Christ that's operating through our lives. So I'm going to pray. Lord, I just thank you that you did it all for us. We're not climbing a ladder to make it to a certain level, but we're using people with a limited capacity to do extraordinary things. And I pray, Lord God, for the boldness and the courage and the confidence be able to shake our lives up and drop fruit wherever we are. In Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed day. If you're not used from here, um, we eat some food that's in there at the back. There's some there. Cup of tea, coffee. A little bit Enjoy this beautiful day. Amen. And shake it.